Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's CRM Magazine web event brought to you by Redpoint Global. I'm Bob Fernickes, and I'm the publisher of CRM Magazine, and I'll be the moderator for today's broadcast. Our presentation today is titled, Leveraging Customer Data to Personalize Engagement. As the title of the uh, presentation implies, today we're going to talk about how to deliver extremely personalized customer engagement consistently across all touch points in real time. Uh, while, why creating an enterprise customer data platform is critical for creating this depth of contextual engagement, and how to extend the existing value of uh, technology investments and also take advantage of new innovations as well. But before we start, I just want to remind everyone that there will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So if you have a question during the broadcast, just type it into the box and click on the submit button. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but if we can't get to it uh, during the broadcast, we'll get to it by, uh, via email within a few days. Also, if you'd like a PDF of the presentation, you'll be able to download it from the console once the event is archived. Now to introduce our speakers for today, we've got James McCormick, he's a Principal Analyst at Forrester Research, and we have Buck Webb, Vice President Cloud Solutions at Redpoint Global. If you want to review the speaker's bios, just click on the arrow under their photos on the console. And now I'm going to pass the event over to, again, James McCormick, our guest from Forrester Research. James. Thank you so much, Bob, and it's a real pleasure to be chatting today. And as uh, Bob uh, mentioned, I'm a principal analyst at Forrester. Uh, my focus area is really around uh, digital intelligence and digital analytics and applying that to the moments of engagement that we have with our customers. Um, and you know, just generally the use of business insights really to uh, compete in this age of the customer. So that's, that's my focus area. And, and for my part today, I'm going to be talking about the link between what we know about our customers during these moments in, uh, of engagement and then how we use that knowledge to personalize uh, those interactions uh, so that we can gain this competitive advantage. And as part of the discussion, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we uh, you know, think about and strategize uh, about data uh, and analytics so that we can drive personalization within the, the systems of engagement that we, uh, digital engagement that we have with our customers. And so to the um, you know, the, the, the title of this part of the, the, the discussion, which is leveraging customer data to personalize engagement. And, you know, uh, no great discussion around, uh, you know, engaging with customers and personalizing with them should go without uh, just a, a, a contextual discussion about this age of the customer that we happen to be in. And, um, you know, my view and the uh, view of many others is that it's really, that this age of the customer is, is really driven by the digital, trans digital transformation that we see upon us, you know, the way that customers are, are uh, you know, changing the way that they are engaging with us uh, digitally and the way that businesses are changing their businesses uh, to be digital. So in this era, we find that customers are more powerful and far more demanding than, than ever before. And um, it's no longer us as brands that have control on how and when our customers decide to discover and explore, uh, you know, their brands and their products and services. It's really the customer that controls the narrative. Um, so what does this mean? Uh, it means that the rules for winning and retaining customers have drastically changed. Uh, winning in this new era demands that uh, we as brands and organizations need to deliver a smooth, consistent, and personally relevant digital experience in order to, to compete. And the only way to get this right at scale is to be excellent at using data and insights, uh, essentially analytics, to maximize and delight the customer every, every uh, digital touch point. Um, and, and we know that uh, digital natives and digitally transformed businesses are, are using insights at scale to optimize and personalize experience to gain a significant competitive advantage at Forrester. We call these the insights-driven businesses. So I hope this uh, sets the scene. Uh, as we review the current st state of personalization and how we can use it ourselves to maximize the opportunity that it provides us. And um, so firstly, let's take a, a look at which elements uh, of uh, customer experience firms are using to personalize uh, with. And you can see uh, from this uh, piece of research, uh, you know, it's our uh, digital experience uh, delivery online survey that we um, that we executed last year, we can see that three quarters of respondents to the survey said that they were personalizing uh, the content of their websites. Uh, around half are personalizing promotions and products uh, and product recommendations. And you can see that less than a third 
uh, are using personalization to optimize device content and layout. So we can see that while the use of personalization to drive experiences varies in line with the pervasiveness of the type of experience and the mechanisms within which they are delivered, personalization, I think, uh, it is unarguably uh, a, a high or a significant business priority. So if it's so important to businesses, let's look at the state of personalization according, uh, according to the numbers. And uh, you can see um, that our research really showing us that our e-commerce, um, uh, sorry, our e-commerce research shows us that 68% of e-commerce professionals have made delivering personalization a priority. That same research shows that, um, you know, similar to the customer experience professionals in the previous slide, over 60% of e-commerce professionals are personalizing their web and email engagements. And um, even uh, more, um, uh, that's around 70% or over 70% of users are, lead, uh, are, are leading, um, uh, you know, see major opportunities to improve in-store experiences, in other words, within the, the, the physical uh, environment. That's kind of where the uh, excitement ends. Um, you know, while, you know, these, these professionals hanker for in-store personalization, the use of practice within traditional digital uh, context of websites still has a lot to be desired as only half report that personalization improves their site conversion rates. I mean, can you imagine that? That's, that's just insane. And you can see that um, you know, even uh, fewer see an improvement in the average order value with personalization. But why is this the case? Well, the first is that, 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 that last stat, that bottom right-hand side, where um, you, know, you can see that uh, you know, over half of e-commerce professionals feel that they lack the technology to personalize uh, properly. So um, secondly, there's a, there's a gap, and we call it the experience delivery gap, and where we see that uh, many studies show that most companies uh, assume that they are consistently giving customers what they want but that uh, usually they, they are kidding themselves. So there's this, um, you know, for instance, there's this recent survey of 362 firms by Bain & Co, um, where they found that 80% of firms believe that they delivered a superior experience to their customers, but when their customers were asked about the, their perceptions, a very different story was heard. Customers of these firms said that only 8% of the companies that they engaged with engage with we're really delivering on experiences so it is clear that uh, there's a major gap between what we think we are delivering and what um, we are actually uh, delivering so why do we have this gap well um, part of the problem is that customer digital engagement has become more complex and um, you know, for those of you old enough think back to the days when the usage of the World Wide Web started uh, to become uh, more pervasive, so we kind of think in mid-90s. Yeah. And you know, back in those days, the way that we understood our customers or they understood success of, of engagement really was really web server logs, uh, you know, network traffic, etc., where it was like, hey, we had, I don't know, 50,000 people hitting our, our site today, if you happen to be a large brand, and you know, that's exciting, but you know, what does it mean, and what do we do with it, and how do we actually use that to, you know, I guess, improve the business, right? And, you know, back then we weren't that sophisticated. It was only until, I guess, the, you know, end of, beginning of last, um, you know, uh, decade where, you know, the, the, the art and practice of understanding customers within the browser and, and kind of what they did and where they came from or, uh, and how they behaved as they were engaging, you know, this, this art and practice of web analytics kind of matured. And the marketing and e-commerce uh, people amongst us were really uh, hyper-invested in, in getting this right. It was only then that we started Order to get some level of sophistication around how, uh, what our customers did. Um, and we could go work with our application and development um, teams to kind of change the experience accordingly to try and get that uplift to improve that experience. That was a very kind of manual process of kind of reviewing, uh, you know, audience um, interactions and then kind of trying to personalize in some kind of a way or at least optimize. Um, you know, then there was this kind of era of digital analytics when it was more than just really the, uh, about website engagements, what, what they, our customers were saying, uh, say on social media and then kind of what that meant in terms of behavior. And we had this kind of moment uh, in time where I call the golden age of web engagement where we felt at least that we uh, understood our customers as they digitally engaged with us and we could use that understanding to, to you know, to optimize engagement with us through things like uh, personalization, be they 
fairly basic rules-based personalization back then. Um, it was only when you know, mobile uh, and kind of what that meant in terms of cross-channel engagement, the ability to uh, perhaps track uh, customers cross-channel, the introduction of new um, kind of app engagements, and now you know the challenge of IoT and, and, and what that actually means, not only for, from a customer understanding perspective, but actually what we're doing with our businesses that really um, have really challenged our um, personalization efforts because, um, you know, how do we understand or even recognize the customer as they engage across these many devices? And then, more importantly, uh, how do we use that understanding to deliver value through the efforts such as uh, personalization? So I guess the second hint as to why personalization is hard and what to do about it is, um, first of all, today we have very a very channel-focused view of our customers, which treats customers differently depending how they engage with us and where they engage with us. Um, we kind of need to move forward to a more strategic, holistic view of the customer that we can use now to sync up our engagements across all channels so that we can have a, a coherent uh, conversation driven partially by more relevant cross-channel personalization. So what can be done about it? Um, well, first, we should take a detailed look at what personalization is, uh, you know, which basically will provide us a, a hint of where we go forward. And so at Forrester, we've um, defined uh, personalization. And so let me read it out here. It's a, an experience that uses customer data and, uh, and understanding to frame, guide, extend, and enhance interactions, uh, primarily based on the person's history, preferences, context, and intent. So you can see that uh, even in our definition of personalization at Forrester, we, we link experiences we provide with the, uh, that of our understanding of the customer during their, their moments of engagement. So you know, the first hint as to how we do personalization well is to understand your customer well uh, when they digitally engage with us. And hence, um, you, you, meant, uh, you might remember I mentioned at the beginning of my, my, my chat was that you know, these insights-driven businesses, so businesses that understand their business and their customers very well, tend to be quite good at the, uh, delivering great customer experiences uh, as well. But that's, that's for another day. So um, you know, let's, how do we start to strategize and think more uh, kind of holistically about personalization? So not only that we can keep up with our competitors, but that we can actually uh, use this as a, you know, to leapfrog them and, and make it a competitive differentiation for us. So, um, you know, for us to be to do that, to uh, to make uh, personalization uh, a differentiation in terms of our brands, we need to be able to scale it, and we need to be able to personalize wherever the customer wishes to engage with us. So, these systems of engagement that we have with them, we mentioned them already: you know, apps, mobile, email, you know, points of sale that are, are digitized. Um, you know, even in-store experiences. We need to really link those with our systems of insight. And by systems of insight, we mean those data, those analytic systems that we have about our customers that help us understand them. And we need to tightly, we, we need to have this overarching strategy that links them um, pretty uh, tightly. So um, let me start to explain in the next couple of slides what that means uh, from a, at a more detailed, pragmatic uh, level. So. Um, you know, firstly, uh, to understand, uh, let's take a, a look at some of the, the, the common ways that we can personalize within the systems of engagement. And the first one is uh, what, what we call behavioral targeting. And, and by this, and I think many of us will understand this already, behavioral targeting are capabilities that deliver personalized experiences to visitors using rules or predictive algorithms based on you know, the visitor's behavior, the characteristics, the, the interaction, uh, you know, the historical interactions that they have with us. And you know, the e-commerce professionals amongst us will reckon, uh, recognize these recommendations engines that personalize content based on rules and algorithms. You know, as I mentioned, these are traditionally associated with e-commerce merchandising around showing visitors complementary or similar project products by, um, but you know, now apply to other markets. So for instance, we have media financial services that are applying it to other applications such as site search, et cetera. Uh, you know, we have test and uh, learn capabilities such as uh, A-B testing, multivariate testing, or other statistical experiment types to compare the performance of different versions of personalized, ex you know, personalized experiences that we provide, so A versus B. Uh, the objective is to statistically determine the best personalization option for a given 
digital customer interaction. Um, and the point of the, this discussion is all these uh, are commonly used powerful techniques that, that are data-driven and are, are, are very much available to all of us today. The problem is that we are not maximizing their use. You can see from our research is showing us that at least um, a third of us don't apply any, any kind of uh, basic behavioral targeting. This, is, this, by the way, was a survey based on, um, it's a fairly small uh, survey, but it was on, uh, we, we were speaking to mature, um, well, uh, sorry, leaders of mature practices when it came to personalization and data, and, and data analytics. And you can see a third of them weren't actually using just basic targeting. And we can, of, of that cohort as well, we saw that half don't even apply uh, recommendations. Again, not, uh, you know, nothing new to us. And even perhaps for me, more, even more shocking, and actually it's probably good news in terms of the, the opportunities we have, we see that a, a large minority don't even use uh, test and learn capabilities. These are very simple to set up, um, and they uh, improve, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they can deliver business value pretty quickly. So uh, what, uh, you know, what does uh, an approach to linking system, systems of insight with systems of customer engagement uh, look like? Well, at Forrester, we kind of, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, this whole digital intelligence or, you know, the use of analytics to drive personalization, we have an, an architecture, what we call the digital intelligence architecture, that, that uh, associates itself or is very much aligned with that whole vision of, uh, combining systems of insight with systems of engagement. So let, let's talk about what we mean. So we, we talked about those three optimization techniques, such as you know, test and learn recommendations and um, you know, behavioral targeting. And we can see that these uh, sit, these techniques, these data-driven techniques on hi hyper embedded within the apps, you know, the call center, within the website, et cetera. Um, but they don't sit alone. They should be, at least from an over, overarching kind of architectural strategy perspective, be sitting on top of an analytics uh, and, and data system that, um, uh, that we call, as I've mentioned, systems of insight. And these need to be uh, integrated in terms of the, the data and insights that, they, that, that uh, feed into these uh, systems of engagement. And as you can see um, here, yeah, it's a, a two-way integration where um, you know, data kind of feeds the analytic system, but the analytic system also feeds the data in terms of it improves uh, uh, you know, the, the actual information we have of our customers, when, and the analytics actually feeds the optimization engine. So, you know, the segmentation, the predictive scoring, um, you know, a bunch of other analytical uh, elements actually feed those those uh, optimization engines that sit within systems of engagement. And just, um, you know, just for, for interest for the, the folks on the call, and there are a number of commonly used capabilities within all of these tiers that we all use today from things like in that mid-tier application analytics, uh, web analytics, spatial analytics, and, you know, was one of the newer ones, IoT analytics is pretty new to most of us anyway. And then in the data side, there's the kind of traditional data warehousing around interaction data, CRMs, of course, we all know that, but then you've got this customer um, uh, interaction profile management systems, there's uh, customer data pl platforms and DMPs that are now emerging to help us kind of manage that data. So you can see, um, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of uh, these tools that we have and, and most of us buy them in isolation. And, and my challenge to you, to, to you today in order so that we can scale personalization um, you know, driven by data and insights is to think about these things as a whole and, and seek to integrate them uh, in terms of processes as best we can. So you can see that we need uh, to take the digital intelligence piece parts and put them, to, uh, put them within a digital intelligence architectural framework that seeks to uh, synchronize and integrate all, uh, all of the components. And the good news is that uh, many leading providers of digital intelligence technologies, as you can see here, um, are starting to uh, bring these together into a, a kind of a platform. Um, and, you know, it's pretty early days for the, the overarching platform, but we are kind of moving towards that. So um, how else can we strategize around personalization? Well, um, let's take a look at the big picture of how customers engage with us, uh, with our brands through the, the life cycle of engagement. And many of you have seen this already, where the customer discovers our brand, 
They then go on to explore our products and services. They buy them, they use them, they are support around them, and then they engage you know, within the broader community and with our brands just generally uh, around other products and services, et cetera. And, and so at Forrester, we believe that this is a uh, you know, customer life cycle, and we really bought into that. Wouldn't it be nice to apply personalization across this whole, this whole life cycle? I mean, what we see is on that right, right-hand right side, it's the marketers, the e-commerce professionals have invested quite, very heavily in personalization and data, and that's kind of where, where it sits. Uh, what we find is that firms that are really gaining strategic advantage with this uh, you know, personalization techniques at scale is actually on that left-hand side. It's within the products as they, um, you know, they, they use it to not only enhance the products and the services that they provide, but also innovate around it. The same with uh, the way that they engage with customers and they, they support them as well. So um, let's take a look at some of these, uh, these firms that are gaining significant advantage with uh, data-driven personalization. So you know, the first up is... Um, uh, is a Hyundai, and you can see with the centric um, offering, they they track and connect cars, uh, connect to cars to ascertain the health and determine the service requirements. Um, you know they then use this knowledge to personalise emails, informing customers at the right time and in the right context when, how, and where the customer, uh, the, sorry, their car needs to be serviced. What they find is that their email open rates are up, but most importantly for them, actually most significantly for them, is that their after-sales business around servicing, etc., uh, servicing cars has benefited with um, you know, their share of the, the overall market increasing, so significant advantage for them. You have IAM um, as a photography community and marketplace um, company. They use in-app behaviors to predict churn. They, uh, they do this by, uh, well, to, to optimize this as well, as well and they optimize by, uh, sorry, they personalize by sending targeted push messages to uh, communicate uh, with users at the right time. And as a result, they were able to reactivate over two-thirds of high-risk users and, and, and they're keeping their, uh, their engagement with these apps at around 600,000 users, so pretty impressive for, from their perspective. Call for Warehouse, the, uh, the kind of Spanish-based uh, retailer, which some of you might know, uh, uses in-store location of customers to personalize the in-store experience by providing directions to in-store products via an app and also targeting those shoppers with offers specific to the aisle that they're in. I mean, how much more personal can you get? And um, yeah, interesting thing, uh, during a, uh, this uh, recent earning call, earnings call, uh, Amazon announced its uh, continued dedication to personalization as a competitive strategy. And it's doing this by investing um, more in improving its data and its recommendations engine. So whilst um, we hold them up as being one of the leaders in this space, they, uh, they're not sitting on their laurels and they're continuing to, to invest quite heavily. A, uh, a smaller company, which uh, many of you may have heard of as well, is Stitch Fix. Uh, it uses sophisticated machine learning engine to ingest behavioral and product consumption data to help fashion uh, their fashion advisors personalize and, and send uh, the right combination of items uh, to its customers and so uh, and sends those items which they are most likely to keep. Um, they, these algorithms not only help drive their personalization but also add, have the added impact of reducing their stock levels to some of the lowest um, you know, that they've seen in their particular industry. Um, and then uh, finally, we've got Starbucks uh, have announced uh, as well in a uh, recent market call its intentions to leverage data collected in its recently launched mobile ordering and payment app that many of us have, and they're going to use that data to personalize experience with, with offers and alerts uh, to customers about recent, recent orders, and that's all being rolled out um, as we speak. So, so I hope you can see that the true power of, of intelligent-led uh, personalization and how it, it, uh, you know, it is driving some of the world's most successful brands, and, you know, and you see the, I hope you can see the benefits that they are getting here. Um, so I guess the next question is, how do we become one of them? How do we join their ranks? And you know, one way is to really break down the problem and assess your, uh, your current personalization state in terms of four, uh, four dimensions. And um, so what we have here, you've got uh, channels personalized. So we've already talked about these channels, right? Um, you know, how much are you personalizing? Uh, you know, which channels are you personalizing in? And you know, obviously many of us are personalizing in web and, and email because those are the two more mat most mature digital channels that we have. 
we are um, but even that, even so many uh, there's a lot of opportunity still to uh, le leverage data driven personalization even with these mature channels not to mention the kind of apps and we've only just started to measure and, and to uh, analyze our app engagement never mind actually use that that data that those insights to drive personalization so there's a huge opportunity in, in apps as well and of course you know, there's the in-store type engagement or in-branch or, you know, physical uh, world uh, engagement that we are busy uh, digitizing or instrumenting for data collection and personalization that represents a huge opportunity for us. Um, we've talked about the customer lifecycle coverage uh, a little bit uh, in that bottom right-hand uh, kind of dimension. As you can see, I've talked about a few slides back where, you know, we shouldn't uh, just be thinking about um, of marketing and, and e-commerce, or uh, but also about using, looking at other parts of the life cycle, such as using what we know of our customers to enhance our products, and therefore the personalization that we can apply in that. And so think about it in, in that kind of way as well. Um, you know the proportions of interactions personalized. The the top right hand one there. I'm going to talk about in the, uh, in the next couple of slides. But essentially, think about the total number of engagements that you're having with your customers, and think about what level of engagements or interactions are what number or what proportion are actually personalized in any kind of way. And suddenly you will discover some opportunities. Um, you know to kind of improve on personalization. I'll talk a little bit about that in, in a few slides time. And, and again. The bottom left-hand side uh, kind of dimension here is personalization techniques. We already talked about, you know, A/B testing, uh, targeting, and recommendations engines. But um, you know, another way of, of thinking about it, um, I'll talk about it on the next slide, is really thinking about these techniques more broadly and seeking to uh, to move towards more automated, more data-driven techniques for personalization. And again, I'll make that a little bit clearer as we go along. But the point of this particular slide is that to say that if you measure the progression of personalization using these four dimensions, it can answer the questions of you know, where to start and how and you know how are you going to progress with personalization. So as I've mentioned, let's talk about those personalization techniques from a, a more strategic perspective. So if you think about uh, you know, data-driven techniques, uh, yeah, particularly around personalization, uh, we can think about it in terms of two dimensions. And you can see uh, you know, the two dimensions or the two axi here are the uh, intelligence method, which are, you know, is it rules uh, driven, sorry, business rules driven, or is it advanced analytics driven? And then the level of automation, you know, is it more manually applied or is it more automatically kind of calculated and, and applied? So hopefully it will make a bit sen uh, more sense as I break this out a bit. So you can see uh, th yeah, basic A-B testing and traditional segmentation. These uh, kind of uh, typically involve uh, the business expert or the um, you know somebody else really uh, deciding how to understand the customers and deciding how to apply that understanding. And so those very business rules are manually focused. Now, if you move up the towards more advanced analytics, but more still more van, man, quite manual in, in, in nature, you see that you got data driven segmentation discovery. You know, still very data driven, but uh, you know, still very um, typically it requires. Uh, an expert kind of sitting there, same with multivariate testing. Now, if you move along the, um, the y-axis, um, sorry, the x-axis to the right-hand side, you can see that uh, in the kind of rules-driven but automatic category, you've got these rules-based targeting, which are you know, based on um, a trigger or a segment that the uh, that the business user creates, but are, is automatically applied. So, hey, you know, somebody comes in from the U.S., show them a stars and stripes. If somebody comes in from uh, the U.K., show them a um, you know Union Jack or you know that kind of thing. Now, on the top right-hand side, you've got already a lot of uh, techniques that we've used a lot already today that are, that are quite mature, that are advanced, that use advanced analytics and are automated in nature. So the point of this slide is that wherever you, whatever your plans for moving forward with personalization, make sure that you start to use techniques that are in that are in, that, that you can place within that top right-hand quadrant, so that are automated, auto, automated in nature, and um, that are advanced, that use advanced analytics. Okay, so. Um, Okay, so the next way of perhaps strategizing around um, personalization is to think about it in terms of the conversations that I have. 
uh, around uh, with companies around um, essentially the interactions that they have with their customers and what proportion they, they of those interactions are actually personalized. Um, so let me make it clear from uh, discussions that I have, and these are discussions that I have on a daily, weekly uh, basis, which I um, aggregate up. And, and one of the questions I, I would ask somebody who runs a personalization practice is, uh, do you get business value from driving digital inter interactions with data and analytics? And of course, they kind of you know, answer me and I kind of, well, yeah, of course, it's, it's well proven to deliver significant, significant value. Why wouldn't we do that, right? And the next question is, okay, so do you monitor the total number of customer interactions that they have? And immediately they kind of, they would say yes. And I say, well, okay, so you have all the, the web interactions, the, the app interactions, the email interactions, your social engagement, you know, the engagement with uh, support, uh, engagement with point of sales, and you all put them into one single dashboard that says, well, here's the total number of interactions or digital interactions I'm having on a daily basis? And the answer is, uh, well, uh, actually, no. And they're not really that sure of the total interactions that they're having. And this is true for, for all of us or many of us, right? And then the next question is, okay, so what proportion of those interactions do you optimize with data and analytics? And of course, uh, because they don't can answer the previous question very well, they don't really know. But when they guess, they kind of guessing is pretty low between five and 15%. So the point here is that you know, there's some easy things that we can do today when it comes to personalization. First of all, you know, to, at least to improve on it. First of all, why don't you put together, bring together in a single dashboard the total number of interactions you're having. Then measure the number of interactions that you're actually personalizing. And then move from, say, whatever it is that you find from 5% to 7.5% in, say, a three to six month period. And you've already increased the, the value that personalization can provide to your overall business by 50%. So you can see this is not rocket science. There's some really good stuff that we can do today. And, um, yeah, I appreciate it. I, I, I'm pretty, getting pretty excited by this and probably uh, extending uh, my, my welcome. But just to finish off my discussion, part of the discussion today, I uh, just want to summarize what we talked about. First of all is you know, take a full life cycle approach to personalization, go beyond the marketing and e-commerce you know, to deliver you know, and use personalization to drive better products and services you know, in order to gain significant advantage from it. Um, and then secondly, use analytics and automation auto, techniques to scale personalization. And um, you know, this will help you, you know, have a kind of a future-proof strategy around it because guess what? Our engagements are exponentially increasing, but the number of people we have to drive it aren't. Um, then thirdly, stop implementing digital uh, data and analytics tech technology in isolation. Have a digital intelligence uh, architecture in mind that I've talked about and uh, to kind of bring it all together. And then finally, you know, build a complete picture of your digital customer engagement. Bring all those engagements together, monitor them, monitor what proportion you're using to personalize, and then um, you know, uh, build a, a, a program of uh, personalization roll-up off the back of that. So with that, Bob, uh, uh, I think I might have overrun my, my I chat by a couple of minutes, but uh, over to you. And I think we we got some exciting uh, stuff uh, still ahead with us today. Great, that was that was great, James. Um, now we're just going to jump into a poll just to uh, take everyone's uh, temperature here. Um, it's uh, choose all or check all that apply. The question is, what type of personalization techniques do you use? Um, content personalization, behavioral targeting real-time recommendations, testing and tuning, or machine learning. So I just want to give everybody a, a chance to do that. Also remind everybody, if you've got a, uh, any questions, just type them into the, the box. Plus, uh, James had tons and tons of great information. I want to remind you that you can download the PDF of the presentation tomorrow once the event is archived. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of great companies, different companies from Everything from financial services, Wells Fargo, John Hancock, to uh, other Veer Bradley, uh, Fashion, uh, Cap Cities, ABC, a um, whole bunch of different companies. Just let, letting you know that there's a lo uh, lot of other people on the, uh, on the webcast today. So let's take a look at the poll results. And okay, so the seems like 75% of the people do content personalization. Behavioral targeting is at 62.5, a little less than two-thirds. 
Uh, Real-time recommendations, 50%. It's a little bit higher than I thought it would be. Testing and tuning at 25, and machine learning at 25. Um, does that surprise you at all, James? Um, no, I don't think it surprises me, but it also, I mean, what it does, especially, I mean, what I like, I mean, it's a couple of observations. If you look at the testing and tuning thing, you know, that this is just simply kind of A-B testing. That represents a huge opportunity. I mean, typically speaking, if you just do a simple A-B test, kind of mid-funnel, you're typically getting improvements, uh, you know, uplifts of about uh, you know, 15 to 25% on the first couple of campaigns. And obviously, as you mature that, that engagement, it then tails off a bit. But there's huge opportunity there. And, you know, uh, you, know you don't have to be start on a high, hyper sophisticated, you know, massive multi-million dollar rollout. There's a lot you can do quite simply with your, uh, your technology today. The other thing on machine learning, that's an interesting thing because a lot of the behavioral targeting actually runs on top of machine uh, learning. You know, some of it's fairly uh, kind of antiquated type of machine learning, but that does apply as well. But no, I don't think any of it really um, surprises me, Bob. It's, uh, it's quite interesting. Okay, great. Thanks, James. Now I'm going to pass the event over again, um, passing it over to Buck Webb, who's the Vice President of Cloud Solutions for Redpoint Global. Buck, welcome to the broadcast. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, well, I'll just get right um, started just right to it. I, I, I think that uh, um, James is right on point. We've been seeing this for a long time in our, in our industry, this, this idea of a, of a gap between um, how we speak to our customers and what channels and media we use to talk to them um, and what the customers' expectations are. And, um, you know, this is a survey result here, of, you know, customer experience index, and it just shows that customers are actually willing to pay for that better experience or they're willing to be more loyal to you regardless of the price. Let's put it that way. You know, if the price is uh, a little bit higher, they're willing to do that because they have a consistent um, what I call reduced friction interaction, where the messaging that I'm getting and the information that I'm getting, whether it's a shipping notification or an offer of some sort um, across all of the brand touch points, they tend to get a bigger share of wallet. They tend to have better, more loyal customers who are willing to uh, engage with them. So it's, a, it's, the, it's the, the goal that all customers, companies I think should should strive to so today I'm going to you know walk you through Redpoint's solution it's a purpose-built solution that uh, provides that ability to do consistent messaging across the touch points and it makes customers want to engage and of course um, from our point of view and I think uh, James has pointed it out a couple of times here too it uh, always starts with the data the data that you already have the data that you collect and then the ability to expand in the other areas with that data to make optimum decisions using uh, analytics real-time decisions uh, and best offers over time so having said that let's just um, take a look here at what we typically see in uh, in large corporations, large enterprise, global companies, as well as even smaller and mid-sized uh, companies. Over time, lots and lots of engagement systems, I'll call them point solutions, have evolved because we have problem X, we see solution Y, let's buy point solution Y and implement it. And many, many times we end up with lots and lots of individual systems of record. In fact, uh, uh, one, one survey that we, uh, w that we have says that uh, of 300 marketing professionals, 62% of the respondents said they had between six, to, 6 and 20 different customer engagement marketing systems. So think about your own enterprise and, and how many systems you use, how many individual point solutions you use where you move data back and forth between them, you move creative, um, you repeat rules, and hopefully everything is okay with those rules across the different solutions. These are the kinds of things that make it really difficult to have that consistent customer experience across these interaction points. And it's quite typical. We, we, we see this quite regularly when we, uh, when we meet with prospects and, uh, and we introduce ourselves to, um, to customers and their roadmap. So what do you have to do? Where do you have to go with this? Well, you need a certain set of capabilities to do this. Um, from our point of view, it always starts with the data. Somehow you have to get this data, get a unified view of the customer or the devices that customer uses, or devices when you don't even know who they are, but you know what their behavior or lack of behavior is. So it all starts with this ability to get this connected data into your, into your system in a customer-centric, typically marketing-owned, uh, platform or a database or a repository of some sort. Once the data is there, it becomes 
really uh, quite uh, straightforward because your data wrangling is reduced. And if you're not familiar with data wrangling, it's the kinds of things that data scientists and analysts and so on have to do in order to get the data together so that they can build purpose-built models. When the data is all connected, that's when you can start driving machine learning. You can do automation uh, between the engagement layer, the data layer, to make real-time decisions, to make decisions that are relevant at that point in time. So that's the next layer in our, in our solution set. Finally, then, there's the message orchestration. And message orchestration or customer engagement, it doesn't have to be marketing many times, uh, you know, shipping notifications and so on. Uh, they're involved in this process because they reflect the state uh, of the customer at a given time. So the customer engagement layer <clears throat> is what lets us really know the state and status of every customer at every time because every time an offer goes out or a message goes out, that is recorded in the connected data layer. And then subsequently, any action or goal that was met, whether it's a click, whether it's an open, whether it's a purchase, whether it's just a simple acknowledgement, or in the case of an IoT device, uh, some sort of uh, willingness to order something on the IoT device or use it as a, as a way to, to interact. All of those things have to go flow back into the connected data platform so that we know the current state and we can give the best answer at the best time and the best offer at the best time to the customer. This includes the CRM solutions as well. So let's look at the customer data platform a little bit. You know, what is, what does that mean, that connected data layer? Well, this is our point of view on the, on the customer data platform, that, that connected data layer down there that supports all of these engagement systems. So it updates the data, and in our case, it doesn't really matter what the volume or variety or source of that data is. We ingest it at whatever speed the data comes in. We do what's called master data management. That's the idea of connecting it all together so that device history is known over time. It's connected to people whenever it's possible or not. And then all the characteristics of that person is put into a thing called the golden record, which we'll talk about in some detail in a minute or two. So the idea is to get that data in there, do master data management on it, and then compute and update the very specific things that are relevant to the customer at this point in time and associate them with a customer or a, or a prospect. For example, you might uh, it might be really key in your environment to have lifetime value or to have net promoter score uh, data collected and calculated. So every time something comes in, uh, we update this inside this golden record and produce it. And we, we uh, can even and typically do calculate preferred touch points and touch point history data because people's preference for the way that they communicate with you or the way they want you to communicate with them varies over time and, frankly, uh, location. As James has said, there's lots of different ways to inter interact with customers and prospects, and we want to make sure that it's possible to know which, what the best one at this particular time is. So the transactional detail, what happens to that? We bring all that transaction data in there. Um, what do we do with it? Well, typically for our customers and for the data scientists and for lots of uh, detail reasons, the, that detail is kept and it's made available in a form or some repository. If it's huge volume, maybe a big data store or a NoSQL store. Uh, if it's not, it could be any of the deployment profiles that you see on the screen here. But in any case, um, that's there so that if you ever have to get back to it and say, well, was that a red thing or a blue thing that they bought, or was that a red thing or a blue thing that they looked at, because that impacts the quality and kind of offer that you're going to make to that customer the next time you talk to them. And speaking to them, um, really, um, I, I see a lot of customers out there that are saying, oh, we do real-time decisions, we do real-time decisions. Well, uh, Redpoint does real-time decisions also. I think the distinction is that we make use of this data layer. It's, it's the speed to the calculation of these results, the speed and the ability to load it and make it available to the other um, engagement systems. That's what the differentiator is for us. We make sure that it's that data is there, and we don't take long times to onboard stuff. It doesn't take us 24 hours to onboard a, a thing. So you can make real-time decisions in real time all the time, but is your data really up to date? Is it really real time in the sense of the quality of the data and the state and status of the prospect or customer? And this is where we uh, actually excel at this data layer, making it available to these other um, systems. So.
moving forward a little bit, I'm just going to drill down and just take a minute or two to just talk about uh, in detail this idea of a golden record. So whether it's a device or whether it's a person or whether it's an IoT device, for example, you know, that, that state and status of that thing, we collect all that information, we aggregate it, it's always on, the data ingestion is always happening, it's very high speed, and it's fully mastered, and that means that we produce persistent keys, which is a technical way of saying we can, we can follow that device or that uh, person record over time uh, and link them together when we have the ability to do that, when the customer reveals himself or through other sources that reveal uh, the customer, so you can match the devices to the person over time. And that means that we can do all these dynamic calculations that support analytics, the things that James is talking about, the analytics, machine learning, real-time decisions, um, uh, A-B testing, multivariate testing. So these things are just built into the platform because the data, as I like to say all the time, is under control. So um, I've kind of tipped off, uh, you know, my position on what real-time decisions is and Redpoint's position. You know, there's the recognition phase, which has got to have consistent resolution uh, of individual level detail and device level detail uh, available all the time within a very short time from the, the time that any data from any source comes in. And we don't require you to rip and replace anything or take anything out. We just simply say to you, where is, where is the data connection? Where does the data, what speed does it come in? And we ingest it and merge it so that we can get real-time contextual insight. And we, we actually have analytics built in, but we also interact with lots of other machine learning uh, and modeling tools as well so that you can use your existing models within it and, or you can use our own. And then we provide an orchestration layer. So this is the layer that says, oh, uh, this person should get this message on this point, uh, on this uh, on this channel at this time, or secondarily, an inbound request for a real-time decision on the next best offer is there. Um, it works great for clienteling, for CRM systems, for uh, front of site website, uh, uh, and you know just about any other inbound or outbound channel. So we provide that orchestration across all those layers, and then lastly, it's a uh, distinction that James has made several times, there's this optimization site. So there has to be this feedback loop. Um, if you're doing analytics and you don't have the feedback loop, then your data is really not doing so, so well for you, right? You've got to have the feedback loop to optimize the next decision, the next best offer, and it needs to be uh, done at speed as fast as possible. So, so <laughs> Customers say all the time, well, this is where we are. We're at, we're at stage X or we're at stage uh, Y. And so how do we, how do we get from, uh, from here to there? So this is kind of a continuum of the way that we see customers. Many of them start with the siloed solutions and perhaps then just getting the data there, you know, is an, is an interesting thing. Getting the data all organized is an interesting thing. Getting it from silos and get it, getting it conformed. So you're using customer data in a sort of always on um, and ready processing golden record of these devices and people. Kind of the next level of sophistication typically is where the intelligent orchestration really starts kicking in across the digital channels, traditional channels, and making sure that messaging is there. And then there's the last, which is the engagement hub. This is the you know, contextually relevant messaging across all the touch points using all the analytics. And customers um, start from silos and go right to the customer engagement hub. Others have a journey that they go on. It might be a, a one-year journey or a multi-year journey, even depending on their sophistication and the availability of their data and, frankly, the ability of the organization um, to align itself and move there. So this is the way we see our customers adding more and more value. The many start at the top and, and just go for the big bang, but many start and just move two channels, three inputs, five inputs, ten inputs, as they mature and as they get better at what they're doing. So the speed is really controlled by, by the customer because we don't sell modules. We're not a... Mm, we don't say, oh, do you need this channel? Uh, awesome, you know, that'll be an extra X, Y, Z dollars. We don't actually do that. All the functionality that you receive from us is there on day one. Whether you choose to use it or not is up to you. 
And we don't ask you to replace your stack. We don't ask you to retag your site. We don't ask you to, um, to remove things that you've already got. All we want to do and all we do do is interface with those things. So we have an open garden concept. What you use, we'll get the data from it and we'll push the data to that thing if need be, but we'll still continue to build that centralized customer data platform that's extremely uh, important. It's probably the most important thing you can do when it comes to building a, a cohesive uh, customer engagement hub is getting the data under control. So that's how we attack that problem. That's how we solve it for our customers. We have many, many customers doing this. Not to belabor this point too much, but our experience in, uh, uh, in doing this for well over a decade, um, we've always believed that data is uh, central to getting things under control. We know, and our customers tell us, and we have many, many proof points, that just by getting the data sources out of the silos, when I say out, making interfaces to those silos, those point solutions, whether it's your ERP system or your um, e-commerce system or your web analytics data stream, so on, getting those things together and getting them in one place literally gives people, um, our customers really, and marketing teams, intense visibility into their data that they never had before with the ability to then make better customized solutions, even without the more sophisticated stuff, they, they always receive significant lift. There's, there's never a case where you can't, where you put the data together and there's no lift. It's because you have visibility into your data for once. So when it comes to, you know, how do I get started and how do I do that, we always tell our customers, begin with the end in mind. Look at what your target needs to be. Look at what channels and media and touch points you need to have and start designing that. Get the data under control and then start designing that solution, but don't build yet another silo. Don't build into yet another silo uh, uh, of more data, another point solution. Start with the end in mind, get the data under control, apply the analytics at whatever level that you can, at the time that you can, and start in immediately engaging across channels and um, engaging with personalization at whatever intensity level that you can do it. It's uh, you know, it's the wave of the past, it's the wave of the future, it's the, the best way to attack the marketing. So with that, there we go. Um, with that, I just want to thank you for your time and I appreciate, uh, appreciate your bearing with us and listening here. I think uh, we're going to turn it over, maybe we have some questions. Great, thanks very much, uh, Buck. Great presentation. I uh, just want to remind everybody, we do have a few minutes, so if you do have a question, please type it in the box and hit submit. Um, I'm going to pose this first question uh, for James, um, but Buck, feel free to chime in. Um, the question is basically, this company is just starting out on its digital transformation journey um, with its data and personalization. Uh, what aspects should they concentrate on first? Yeah, and that's an interesting one, and um, you know, Buck actually gave us a, a hint, I think, uh, just uh, initially, which is kind of begin with the end in mind, and for me, the way that I, I, I talk about that when I'm speaking to, to my customers is actually begin with the personalization or begin with the value delivery. What is, what is it do you want to uh, personalize, and why do you want to do that? You know, is it a uh, marketing optimization, is some kind of customer experience optimization, product delivery, or, or whatever? And, and, and then, uh, but you know, secondary to that is, um, you know, start small with little projects uh, that actually deliver some kind of, say, targeted behavior or targeted personalization. Um, some kind of optimization of that personalization decision. And what you'll find is the, the level of data you need to drive that is not very sophisticated. So start small, deliver value immediately, and use that as a selling tool to um, A, uh, you know, influence the you know, strategic decision makers within your organization um, to kind of say, well, this is valuable, this, this kind of stuff, and, um, but also to work with your peers to help you sell to your peers to kind of say, you know, this, this, this kind, these kind of approaches could be useful to other parts of the business. And by doing these small iterative little projects around delivering personalization, you then start, and, and, and you're not making major investments there, right, but you, you're leveraging your existing assets 
to deliver that. But you, in, in the process, you're building up a business case, a vision, a strategy, and most importantly, bringing along uh, the company with you. So yeah, uh, that's that's one, and we can talk forever on it. But that's uh, you know, for me the most powerful way to get started. Great. Buck, um, actually, James just reminded me that you did uh, mention begin with the end in mind. Um, but can you help this person uh, understand, like, is there a best way to get started, uh, especially if they're just starting out on the journey and haven't made yeah, some I key think, decisions? I think, probably? James is, I think he's touched on that. I think that um, from, from our perspective, uh, you know, we can't, the technology is not going to solve organizational problems. So uh, challenge number one is, is, like James says, you know, start with what you can start with and do what you can do with what you can start with, right, and get the wins and proof it out and, uh, and start building that data connectivity. That's the connectivity that, uh, that makes it so that if you're successful, you can add other media, other channel, other inputs, and start building up that profile, that consistent profile, um, that is as close to real time as possible. It's it's because it's not going to get any easier, and the data is not going to get any less. So start somewhere that it makes sense, and and really start building out that connectivity layer. So I, I think that would be my uh, typical advice to customers when they start out. Okay, um, James, I'll, I'll pose this to you, and again, Buck, feel free to uh, chime in. Um, here's a company, and they have a lot of the technology and. A, uh, adopted a lot of the approaches already, but they seem to not be gaining any traction, maybe a little mired, maybe a little stuck in the weeds. Um, any ideas on where they can go from here and start seeing some some uh, value? Yeah, and I, I think uh, actually it's, it's pretty typical of, of many of us, right? We have a lot of technology, we have a lot of data, a lot of personalization uh, capabilities, right? But they tend to be uh, very kind of tactically applied. And I think, that, you know, the secret's not, um, well, the, the, the ultimate solutions, um, uh, well, the biggest thing to solve really is not the technology side of things, but really is having a kind of a culture and a strategy that is customer centric in nature. And what that means in the kind of data and personalization world is that we have a holistic view of that customer that we can track across you know, their entire life cycle. And to have a strategy that, se- that is going to sync up our personalization efforts across you know, from when we acquire them for when they are converting them, from when they're exploring and using our products and services, right? And to have a customer-centric and not a channel-centric strategy. And it's that just that basic vision is lacking in a, a lot of companies that are kind of mired and kind of stuck in um, you know, with all the, the this massive investment, right? That's not delivering the value that it should be. So yeah, uh, that, that, that would be a start. Okay, great. Um, Buck, you had mentioned that um, essentially the way Redpoint sort of starts out is, is that uh, the company can kind of grow as they get a little bit more advanced. But how long would it, you know, how long would it take to get the advanced uh, capabilities that you've described once somebody's went through the learning curve? Well, that's a, that's a great question. The, the typical uh, the typical company uh, is going to go through a deployment phase, and, and, you know, and I'll just talk about a division of a, of a, of a global company that's probably easier, but a midsize uh, and global companies will really start, typically we see it will start in a division or, uh, or a, a large subset of their business that operates, uh, you know, say semi independently it's got a cohesive message but it's uh, focused on merchants or it's focused on uh, prospects acquisition or just customers you know they they're, they're divided up in that way they have silos within silos so typically within those kinds of things we're talking about somewhere between 12 and 23 weeks um, start to finish mostly because a lot of the customer data platform, the matching and the, the fuzzy fuzzy data things, all of those things are, are really already built inside of our platform. It's a matter of mapping that stuff in. And so typically that's what we see in deployments. We, we regularly do those th- kinds of deployments in, in, um, in certainly less than six months. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to wrap up with this one last question since we are running out of time. What, do you, what would you calculate as a typical payback period for these kind of capabilities? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, as I said at the out, uh, at, at the end there, when, when when I was talking about you know the value provided by just getting the data in order, our our customers get payback periods in months because they're able to do. We and we know this, and they report this to us. It's pretty simple to measure because they're able to do things when the orchestration is uh, tied to this connected data that they could never do in their existing system. So the accretive revenue is actually pretty uh, pretty straightforward to, to measure as compared to maybe other kinds of uh, measurement functions that one might think. So some of our retail customers, one of my recent uh, retail customers that we um, uh, deployed and worked with them to deploy in another partner um, last year, got their payback just during the holiday period, right, because it was all new functionality, all new personalization, that happened during the holiday period. Others, you know, we're talking about uh, months to a year or so, but it's not typically a multi-year uh, problem to get the payback. Okay, great. Well, listen, uh, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today, and um, that's all the time we have any you know, questions for. Uh, I want to thank everybody that submitted questions, and remind you, if you'd like a copy of the presentation, you can download it once the event is archived. Don't worry, you'll get an email. Um, pointing you to the archive or you can share it with a colleague. I'd also like to thank our speakers for today. Again, we have James McCormick. He's Principal Analyst for Forrester Research and Buck Webb, Vice President of Cloud Solutions at Redpoint Global. And for everybody that tuned in, you could win this 7-inch Fire tablet. Uh, the win winner will be posted on Destination CRM on July 31st, so visit our website or we'll send you an email if you are the lucky winner. And again, thanks for joining us, and that concludes our broadcast for